And so the, the title of my talk today is, I know it when I see it, the invisible flourishing public humanities in Virginia. So why this title for my presentation? Um, take the first part of it. You probably all have heard this little cute phrase, I know it when I see it. Um, this comes from a slightly longer opinion from the US Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart in 1964 in his ruling on Jacobellus versus Ohio when the state of Ohio convicted Nico Jacobellus, who owned an art house films, you know, place where it goes see art films, uh, in, of, on several counts of possessing and exhibiting an obscene film, namely Louis Malle's The Lovers. Stewart wrote, I shall, and he was actually, actually overturning the conviction, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material that I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description, meaning hardcore pornography, and perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so, but, and I think this is the part where we all have heard, I know it when I see it. While Justice Potter's statement underscores his inability to define obscenity, I think that the irony for the humanities is that even though it shares a similar definitional challenge with obscenity, we, and by we, I mean all of us here, but certainly the public, actually often don't know the humanities when we see them. Even what I would argue is their ubiquity the humanities are, for all intents and purposes, invisible. And yet the title also alludes to this flourishing, which kind of seems contradictory to invisibility. This brings up several questions and issues. What does flourishing actually look like? What is meant by the public and the public humanities? And what, if anything, does the phrase flourishing public humanities suggest about the humanities outside the public, namely inside this building today? and inside other four-year colleges and universities. I have to admit that when I told Christina what I was going to discuss, I actually was not fully aware of where my thinking was going to lead. But as I started down this path, I began to shift the emphasis from talking about things that Virginia Humanities does as the Tate Humanities Council, and thinking more about things that we, collectively, here, outside of here, should be asking together with the goal and the hope of creating a stronger foundation for the humanities, for inclusive democratic culture, and for the future of the human. So just a brief outline of this conversation, uh, where I'm coming from. First, I want to say a little bit about my own origins. I am what you call an alternative academic. I hate that phrase. But I got my PhD in English at UVA. I started working full time as I was writing my dissertation, raising family with my wife. And uh, so, you know, I, I was, we were around the table at lunch talking today, talking about like how long it took us to do these things. We were writing at two o'clock in the morning because we were also doing, life was happening. So I, I come from that kind of background. But as I was working full time in the digital library at UVA, I sort of reestablished a new set of values and what I was thinking about my own future, which is focusing on democratizing information, thinking about the public humanities, thinking about public culture. Um, and so, as I saw an opportunity at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, which is what we were called back when I uh, first got my job there in 2005 to build the encyclopedia, I immediately jumped for it. So since 2017, though, I've been the executive director of the State's Humanities Council. In this role, I've had to shift into being a project coordinator and director into being an administrator, a fundraiser, manager, a leader. And as my colleague and director of the New Jersey Humanities Council, Karen Berkowitz, wrote last summer in our co-authored piece in Daedalus called Reframing the Public Humanities, the Challenges and Potentials for a More Expansive Endeavor. Running a State Humanities Council, we're like amphibians. Having one foot in the world of academic scholarship, having the other in nonprofit business management, and really not comfortable in either world. So just keep this background in mind as I go through this, uh, and maybe you'll be forgiving of me as I make some assumptions and presumptions. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about a couple of the issues that we'll, we'll cover here. First is just to situate the context of what I see as a, very, as a very challenging definitional issue, or in the business world, a marketing dilemma. We'll, talk, we'll take a shallow but informative dive into some of the 1960s and 70s history of the humanities and look at a couple of definitions. I wish we could actually take the history of the NSF in the 60s and the NEA and the NEH in the 60s and sort of talk about how those things came to be in sort of maybe a larger context. I'll then highlight what is happening to humanities disciplines today in higher education. And I imagine many of you know what's happening, or at least have heard what's happening. Maybe it's not happening here, 
This is certainly happening in other places, like our dear Marymount University up in Northern Virginia, shutting down a lot of its humanities programs. Um, and then I'll also think about and talk about, posit some ideas about why this is happening, maybe. Maybe you've probably thought about a lot of these as well. And then we'll explore the public humanities and what I mean by public humanities through some of the work of Virginia Humanities. And lastly, I'll end by posing some questions and thoughts about how, and even in their amorphousness, the humanities might be resourced and framed more expansively to be seen as critical to our future. And to do that, we'll circle back to this question of definitions. And maybe do we need a definition at all? So uh, some history and definitions here. Um, so this is actually part of the legislation of the 1965 National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act. that Lyndon Baines Johnson signed into law along with the Voting Rights Act of that year. I mean, imagine all this amazing sort of constructive legislation coming out of Congress. Can you imagine anything, how like this, anything aspirational like this happening today? It's amazing. Um, but if we're gonna talk about the state of the humanities and public humanities and ask ourselves questions to find a productive way forward in the situation that we find ourselves in with reductions in majors and departments for more profitable fields like tech and engineering and STEM, and it might be helpful to look back at this legislation for some context. This legislation called for the democratization of the arts and the humanities by underscoring the public as the primary actor and stakeholder in the world of ideas. Look at that very first uh, article. The arts and the humanities belong to all the people of the United States. It then declares that democracy demands wisdom and vision of its citizens. It must therefore foster and support a form of education and access to the arts and the humanities designed to make people of all backgrounds and wherever located masters of their technology and not its unthinking servants. Again, we think, I'm sure Sylvester last week talked a lot about artificial intelligence and where we're heading and what we need to be thinking about in the world of STEM to make sure that we are doing the best we can through this technology for the human-centered universe. It's hard to imagine, again, a bipartisan bill being produced today that could be so aspirational. Um, but again, uh, this bill, I think you can understand when the NEH was created, Congress was not really focusing on ensuring that the humanities were thriving in R1 universities. They were focused on the public. So despite the public emphasis of the legislation, in its early years, the NEH was quite sluggish to, head this, to heed this directive, focusing instead on more academic matters. And according to Jamil Zineldeen in his essay, Public Works, NEH, Congress, and the State Humanities Councils, it wasn't that NEH leadership, it was not that NEH leadership was opposed to public involvement in the development of the humanities as such, it is that they could not visualize programs originating outside these expert and professional domains of the academy. These early years at NEH in some ways reflected the divide and at times disparaging perspectives from the academy for the public humanities that sometimes we still see today. Unlike the NEH, the NEA was quicker to embrace its public mandate by creating a model of state and regional arts commissions to support the work of artists and practitioners at the hyper-local level across the nation and getting their work out to public audiences. Senator Claiborne Pell, whose large picture you see here, uh, was one of the primary authors of the 1965 Arts and Humanities Act but he was puzzled that the humanities endowments leadership could not or would not grasp that state-based entities would garner more public support for the humanities while also making it easier to, quote, help you, in other words, the NEH, help yourself here on the Hill. Namely meaning, how do you get more funding for the work that you wanna do? Pell began to butt heads with the NEH's first chair, Barnaby Keeney, who he himself was a medievalist and prior president at Brown University. And so that the point was not going to be missed, NEA's budget began to grow well above NEH's up until the mid-90s. And Congress even threatened complete elimination of the NEH if the agency did not act. So seeing the writing on the wall, NEH finally followed NEA's lead and beginning in the early 1970s, created a network of affiliate humanities councils across the nation. However, the humanities council model differed, differed, uh, differed from what what actually was happening in the arts communities, because in the arts communities and the arts commissions, those were actually state agencies. They were thus 
held to some of the partisan squabbles that would happen and changes in administration. Instead, councils became full nonprofits. So there was a double-edged sword there. Being a nonprofit, you weren't guaranteed state support. Luckily, we have state support of Virginia Humanities, but not every council does. As, a, as an arts commission, you're, the state is mandated to give support in equal terms to what the federal government gives you through the NEA. So you're, you're hamstrung in one way being a nonprofit, and yet you're more liberated from the political shifts in, in our wins. Councils were founded as NEH's boots on the ground, if you will, as grant makers who had a more intimate knowledge of their localities and could do a better job of supporting more grassroots humanities efforts. Some, like Virginia Humanities, started producing their own programs. In addition to grant making, for instance, Virginia Humanities publishes, as, as Mungala just referenced, Encyclopedia Virginia. We produce With Good Reason, which I, some of you have maybe been on before, uh, which is actually a radio program that actually takes and translates, if you will, the amazing research that you all are doing to be understood by the public. And it is, it is home to both the Virginia Folklife Program and the Virginia Center for the Book. We are, as I like to say sometimes, a permeable membrane between the public and the academy and the translator of the work in both the higher ed and in the public. And that direction goes both ways. Okay, so definitions. This is where we start to get into some problems. Um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I think if you want to highlight the fact that this is just a litany of, of disciplines. The humanities are this and this and this. And also, we're going to include the word humanities in the definition. Ugh, really? So despite the courageous, purposeful, and active doing language of the legislation itself, those acts that I showed you before about belonging to all human beings, all people, um, this circular definition from that legislation is unfortunately still how the NEH mostly defines the term humanities on their website. And they're not alone. More often than not, even when I'm asked, what are the humanities? I resort to, oh, there are things like literature, history, blah, 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 blah. It's not very inspiring when somebody asks you in the elevator about that. So we just give a list of dry disciplines, even though the activities that are happening in those disciplines are certainly not dry. But at least this posits what the humanity, humanities fields are in the academic realm. And then there's this definition from Wikipedia. Humanities, <laughs> I'm not going to read it again, but what I find interesting is, uh, let's see, more frequently defined as any fields outside of, OK? So as you read through this, uh, you know, and also it talks about the grandiose history of the natural sciences, Aristotle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yet unlike the sciences, there is no general history of humanities as a distinct discipline in its own right. Further explanation needed. Further explanation indeed. Here at Wikipedia, at least a few days ago when I looked this up and pasted it on this a slide, defines the humanities through negation. As all those things left on the cutting room floor, once you've removed the sciences from them. And again, we wonder why the humanities are invisible. So the humanities in higher ed. The humanities being in crisis is nothing new. We've been hearing this actually since the 60s, if not before. Um, but perhaps there really is something about today that's different. Thinking about making the United States Florida, for instance, um, as I read in the Washington Post today, it's one of the headlines. It's not a really great, great situation for research in the humanities. Certainly not a great, great uh, I think a great model for how we're talking about inclusive history um, and equity. I think today the situation is certainly more acute. As previously noted, at most four-year colleges, humanities majors are in decline. At some schools, take Marymount University here in Virginia, traditional humanities majors now the etherized patients upon the table of economic cuts. All of this in a time when we most need the humanities to do things like question the ethics and impact of world transforming technologies like AI, to bolster civic engagement and information literacy in a time of rising authoritarianism, conspiracy theories, and investigative journalism's ecosystem that is being picked over and sold off by the hedge funds that now own that ecosystem. Oh, good, it worked. Cool. I was afraid when I did it in Google Slides, it would not translate very well. Um, so, uh, ah. <laughs> 
So why this crisis? So financially and culturally, this crisis is due to a number of possible reasons that, again, you're probably all quite familiar with and probably thought much more complicated about and in much more complex ways about this than I have. Um, and I'm sure there are actually more reasons than the ones I'm alluding to today. But let's start with just you know, the first. So after the economic downturn in 2008, and this is often the sort of like mile marker that people point to is like, oh, that's when the humanity started to drift downhill. I think it was probably before that. But after the economic downturn in 2008, public colleges and universities lost some of their direct support from the state. And today it's still not really recovered. Take UVA, for instance. In 2007, state funding for the, this is before the recession, state funding for the academic division accounted for almost 15% of its revenue. Again, that's not a great number. In 2011, that figure was 8.2%. 8 in 2008, sorry, in, 2000, in 2011, it was 8.2%. It was uh, in 2022, it was marginally better at 10.3%. So still not great. But universities are big business. Right? And as a big business, public higher education is not blameless. And this is, this, I don't want to sound negative, but I just have to be honest, right? I think we need to sort of talk about the world around us. Um, and their efforts to throw off the velvet handcuffs and bureaucracy of the state. In 2005, UVA, William & Mary, and Virginia Tech asked then Governor Mark Warner and the General Assembly to rewrite their charters to give those universities more flexibility. The schools dreamed of and embraced a future of less state funding because that meant fewer strings and more flexibility to pursue the things that they wanted to pursue without state intervention. That also meant the cost to accomplish all those great things that those universities wanted to do in their expansive mindsets would be passed, of course, as always, along to the consumer. In 2008, we had this perfect storm. Escalating tuition, meeting up with a nasty years-long recession and the impact, is a loan debt that continues to crush the most recent two generations of our student bodies. So where do, the, where do the invisible humanities appear in all this? Well, they don't, because they're invisible. Amidst this tumultuous sea of debt, STEM has been, and again, this is not like putting an us versus them. I think what I want to get to today is the idea that we need to stop thinking in that realm. It's not an us versus them. It's not a my discipline versus your discipline. And yet I know the, the reality of it is, it is that because that's how we get our FTEs. That's how we get our resources, is showing the majors that we have in English, showing the majors that we have in information technology, et cetera. But there needs to be a fundamental sea change here, I think. So where do the invisible man and humanities appear? They don't. STEM has been buoyed up by higher ed and governmental marketing campaigns. President Obama, for instance, made STEM education part of his platform throughout his presidency. And parents, and perhaps the students themselves, have looked to STEM as their life raft, life raft <laughs> towards jobs and less debt after college. And finally, and I think this has more to do with the crisis we find ourselves in than almost anything else in some ways, humanities departments in higher ed are, are their own worst enemy. Or maybe a better way to put it, they are the worst enemy of the humanities. Rather than try and be creative in how we adapt to this quickly changing world, to embrace and advocate for, for interdisciplinarity, to experiment with public engagement work that serves communities beyond the academy, universities and their departments cling to a, merit and ad, to a merit and advancement system that is woefully outdated at its core, deeply conservative, not politically, but in its rigidity. Think about, obviously, the requisite monographs you had to produce to get tenure. And I'm, not, I'm not talking about the people who are tenured. You have that liberated feel, right? You have the strings are no longer really attached to a certain degree. It's more the people who are coming in, newly minted as assistant professors or even adjunct professors, thinking about how they advance, how they can actually engage the world around them. So we are in a moment when our democracy is, in generous terms, imperiled. And as humanities practitioners, we are challenged to communicate their value in these times. Ironically, we, all of us, are accomplices to their invisibility. Hopefully I'm not going to be running out of time here. Some bright spots. <laughs> and, 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 and hopefully this is not going to be an exploding supernova as I have here, but actually more sustainable views of what humanities trends are actually happening on out there. So take the University of Arizona. Over the last few years, as most other four-year colleges have seen a sharp drop in humanities majors, the UVA has experienced a 33% increase in those majors. The reason? 
They've shifted into something called applied humanities, entrepreneurial humanities, creating curricula where their humanities students work in practicums alongside students from business, from STEM disciplines, et cetera, putting them in environments to identify, navigate, and help solve challenges and issues that crop up in quote unquote, real situations, okay? And this way students from all backgrounds and acad academic disciplines um, get to see in practice how critical thinking skills enhance other environments and disciplines, how large challenges ahead of us require interdisciplinary thinking and collaborative effort. Something that he, the humanities world is not great at. We don't, we don't co-author pieces often, right? That's not what we do, and that's okay. But there's, so you're, there's, there's shifts in that, but I, think, but I think that's not what we typically do, and I think that's actually why we do the research, how we do it. It's important that we do that. But maybe things have to shift a little bit. AU highlights the role of their applied humanities majors to corporate recruiters. And to double down on this effort, AU is also doing some creative marketing. Take, for instance, uh, this billboard that their College of Humanities put up in Phoenix last year, this year. Okay, humanities equals jobs. Woo. If you're like me, you probably look at this and hold in one hand enthusiasm for this creative approach and success, while simultaneously, on the other hand, there's this queasy sense that we've sold out to the institutions and systems that the humanities have traditionally been in place to question and critique that we've reduced the humanities to being a tool for job preparedness versus being a more transcendent guide for reflection and life preparedness. In our hopes that the humanities here will survive, can we hold these feelings together simultaneously? Are there other equally fruitful ways to imagine an abundant future for these disciplines? So working through my thoughts to this point, I have to admit that perhaps the humanities, in order to survive in higher education, might need to adapt the professional training ground that the university has become or is becoming. That maybe the ideal of a liberal education is in fact a luxury that is no longer relevant. I'm not saying it's true, I'm just putting it out there. Just to, it's, it's provocative, you know? Um, that maybe the humanities major itself isn't as important as how humanistic thinking and process are integrated deliberately and creatively across disciplines to see that STEM needs the humanities, that the humanities needs STEM, and that the human being needs both. I don't say this to sound fatalistic. I say it again to be provocative, because I think we need that, and I think that universities need to adapt so to meet today's challenges. So the humanities and the public. In the time I have left, I wanna talk a little about the flourishing and yet still invisible public humanities. When we look at the humanities in the public sphere, and by this I mean where the humanities are produced and owned by the public, not where, you know, uh, like at UVA, they do some public humanities work, meaning some students go out into the community with an idea and what's called they extract from the community. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actually being imagined by and, 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 and bursting forth from those publics. We see humanities activities that are liberated from things like the disciplinary walls and the institutional politics and finances that enforce them. Mind you, definitionally, the public humanities are just as invisible as the humanities in higher ed. And let me explain this a little. I was fortunate to attend a recent conversation at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that was reflecting on the 10-year anniversary of Heart of the Matter. This is a publication you're probably all familiar with, and many of you are meant to highlight why the humanities are important, at least why they were 10 years ago. During this conversation, we were talking about whether a definition for the humanities even mattered. One of the attendees offered a perspective that has stuck with me. When the public comes to the humanities, he suggested, they do so out of their lived experiences. They don't do so out of a definition. With almost 20 years at Virginia Humanities, I've come to see that along with the critical research and knowledge creation that happens here in the academy, Communities beyond, the, beyond academe have also been leaders in knowledge creation, engaging in activities to document, preserve, and transmit local history and tradition that the terms scholar and uh, scholarship are expansive and include things like, or should include things like, genealogy and bearers and tellers of centuries old oral and performing traditions. But the public's interest in activities in storytelling and meaning making is vast. 
And if we higher ed, organizations like Virginia Humanities that serve the public, allegedly serve the public interest, and the public itself, could think about and do the humanities broadly together, we could create an environment that is truly inclusive and just, and where the humanities is maybe not invisible, but we can identify it together. So I want to give just an example of, 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 of maybe something that tries to, a project that tries to get at that kind of constellation. Um, so there's this project called the Yancey School Heritage and History Project, which again, we were just passive funders of. We didn't do a lot with. But uh, the idea was that in 2017, the local school board in Esmont, Virginia, voted to consolidate Benjamin Franklin Yancey Elementary, which was actually a black-only school right before desegregation, right before massive resistance. Um, they were gonna consolidate it with two other schools and turn the old Yancey building into a community center. So Peggy Scott, who's shown here, and Charlotte Brody learned of this action and they wanted to recognize the school's namesake and document the school's history and the people li still living in the Esmont region who went there and to talk about their experiences. So when the county school board of supervisors moved to create the community center, Scott and Brody, the residents of Esmont, uh, saw their opportunity to do something in the center itself. So without forming an organization or their own nonprofit, and we could actually talk about the non nonprofit industrial complex too as a challenge and barrier to proliferating the humanities. I'm guilty of that, absolutely. Um, but with their vision and their passion, they developed and installed the BF Yancey Heritage and History Exhibit, exploring Yancey's life and the story of black education in Esmont and the surrounding community before, before integration. And even though, again, we provided the grant supporting, the idea, the work, the execution was purely the result of these two individuals and the communities that they engaged. They also worked with an academic historian who had knowledge of best practices around things like collecting and documenting oral history in the community. And also, how do you, re how do you research these primary documents from local libraries and archives to really fill out that story? So in some ways, this, this story itself highlights what can happen when maybe we think and act broadly together. So this more expansive endeavor. Before, we, uh, before Ray and I open it up to your questions, I just want to ask a few of my own, really. Um, and some of these, again, are meant to be provocative. Some are more pointed, but all these are, are pretty serious. If we were to try and re reinvent how the humanities are taught and practiced in higher ed, what are the obstacles to that creative vision? If you can identify those, how do you remove those obstacles or at least blunt them or shift them? How do we shift from deficit and zero sum game thinking? We might say, for instance, or I've heard some colleagues say of my own, look at all the money that NSF gets and look at the size of the grants and all the capital infrastructure that our STEM departments are getting. Uh, why do donors, funders, and the administration value them over us? If we can shift that deficit mindset into an empowered mindset where we know and can communicate the importance of humanistic practice in different situations and use that knowing to collaborate across disciplines and with the public as a way to solve today's and tomorrow's challenges, that could be revolutionary. If we were to think broadly, horizontally, about the humanities and its importance to civic life, instead of solely about the vertical, institutional, departmental, or area identities and resources that we need to receive, what might, inter what might interdepartmental co coalitions or even coalitions between higher ed and the public look like? And lastly, and this goes to NSF maybe, and to NEH, and to NEA, and to Mellon, and Ford, and all these wonderful funders out there, what could and should funders be doing to create these new environments that supports the humanities more broadly, but also things for the betterment and encouragement and empowerment of human society? This could be akin to what community-centric philanthropy tries to do in addressing broad socioeconomic issues. So community-centric fundraising means, A, it's focused on the public because that's where the missing millions are, right? That's where 
That's, where we, that's really who we're trying to hopefully ideally reach, whether it's our students who will go out with the work that we teach them, what they'll learn and be inspired through in our classes. That's what we try to do. So community-centric fundraising is this idea that instead of giving $5 million to Virginia Humanities or $5 million to the English department at VCU to solve this problem, even though I know the humanities don't really solve problems. <laughs> that's all we do. We ask questions, that's, that's a, and that's a good thing. But if we, if, instead of like these larger issues, instead of looking at the larger issues and collaborating on them together, what if funders could say, hey, we want to fund a broad spectrum. We want to give this grant to VCU, Virginia Humanities, and these three communities in Richmond to do this great work. Why couldn't that happen? I know that, for instance, Mellon has a great project with uh, a couple of community colleges in the VCU area that's feeding those, those students in this community, those two-year colleges, into VCU as a pipeline for, uh, for their own achievements in the humanities in the future. Something like that. So I guess lastly, um, is, this, is this kind of vision something we'd even want? Would we, be, would, we, would we be willing to sacrifice what we have today to get that tomorrow? I don't know the answer to any of these questions, and that's probably why I know they're humanities questions. Um, but I do hope that we can spend some time discussing them and think together about what that more expansive endeavor might be. Thanks.